Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another info session from CLHO and Connecticut Humanities, and this time the Connecticut Heritage Foundation. Um, sometimes I just feel like there are so many grants and too little time, um, but we're really glad to have you with us today to hear about the newest grant line um, brought to us by the Connecticut Heritage Foundation with funding from Connecticut Humanities for collections assessment grants. Um, we are really excited to share this information with you all today. It's something that Emily and Scott and Leanne and I have been talking about a lot on our site visits when we go out around the state. Um, and we know that Kathy Carwell Varda, who I know many of you probably know as well, has been super excited to get this grant line off the ground. Um, so I just want to welcome you today, um, just say a few logistical things, talk about a couple of things that the league has coming up, um, and then I'll hand things over to our presenters. So um, we will be recording this session. We are recording right now. Um, uh, the video will go up on our YouTube channel afterwards, and you should get a follow-up email from Emily as well with a link to the recording um, and any important links related to the grant uh, that come up over the course of our conversation today. Um, we have with us today Ken Wigan, who many of you know as the recently retired state librarian, but certainly not idle. Um, he is also the treasurer of the Connecticut Heritage Foundation. We're glad to have Ken back with us. Um, Kathy Crowell Varda, who's the director of conservation connection at the Connecticut State Library and also a museum consultant who may have worked with you on perhaps your strategic plan or something else like that. Um, never a stranger to folks in Connecticut. And of <laughs> course, uh, two people you probably know very well, Scott Wands and Leanne Partridge from Connecticut Humanities. Um, who direct and assist in the Grants and Programs Division of CTH. Mm -hmm. um, also here with me today from CLHO is the wonderful Emily Garfinkel, our Membership and Programs Manager, um, who will be uh, you know, recording and both Leanne and Emily will be monitoring the chat. Um, so if you have any questions as we go, please feel free to pop them in there. Um, I know the two of them are really responsive and great at getting back to you. Um, and if we don't get to your question um, before they're done presenting just in the chat, um, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions live or in the chat after our group has finished presenting. Before I hand things over to Ken, Kathy, Scott, and Leanne, I just want to say a few things about some programs that we have coming up from the league. You've probably been getting a lot of emails from us. Um, it's because there's so much going on in September and October. So I just want to draw your attention to a few things. Um, on Thursday of this week, we have a virtual program that we're doing with the State Library, uh, part of a newspaper digitization webinar series that they're running. Um, called what do you have what do you digitize newspaper format and title selections so that's Thursday at noon. Um, we're also running um, later this month another virtual workshop with the wonderful Cindy Tolosa from Connecticut Humanities, who will be talking about how to use your annual appeal to share your story and do a successful end of year appeal. I'm excited about that one personally. We have uh, the Archives 101 uh, series coming up uh, in starting on October 4th. And I also wanna, uh, I just sent out publicity about these, but CLHO is also engaging in its own strategic planning process right now. Um, and we'll be running a series of focus groups around the state later this month. And I wanna um, invite you to come to um, whatever one of those happens to be convenient to you. We'll be in six different locations around the state later in September. Um, these are free. It's a great chance to um, give your feedback and input on what you'd like to see from the league in the future um, and hear a little bit about the directions we're thinking of going in. So I hope to see you at some of those. Without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Ken, who's going to say a little bit about the Connecticut Heritage Foundation and the origins of this grant. Ken, go ahead. Thank you, Amherst. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to see so many people interested in this grant program. The Connecticut Heritage Foundation as an autonomous foundation was established by the legislature to support the programs and purposes of the State Library and the Museum of Connecticut History. And it allows uh, the foundation, provides a way for private citizens, organizations, foundations, and corporations to support the preservation of Connecticut's historical record and innovation in the delivery of library services. So what's important here is that the State Library cannot accept uh, cannot apply for or receive grants directly from the Humanities Council. So the Heritage Foundation fills an important function there. And this way, it also fills, helps us with some of the um, purposes of the foundation, one of which is to expand um, our educational programs 
to promote the uh, history and culture of our state. So we're really excited. Personally, I'm also excited because when I was state librarian, we established a uh, conservation connection along with Kathy. So uh, spent many, many years looking for funding to do all the things that we knew needed to be done. So this is a really exciting opportunity, I think, for the library and for the state. So thank you all for being here and showing an interest in the grants. Now I guess it goes to Kathy. Thank you, Ken. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. So fabulous to see so many familiar faces, some new faces. I'm really excited to share with you today this brand new grant opportunity here in Connecticut and really want to thank Connecticut Humanities for providing the funding and the Connecticut Heritage Foundation um, for being such a willing partner on this project. And of course, you can't do anything in Connecticut without the Connecticut League of History Organizations bringing us all together. So great, uh, great way to start the week, in my opinion. So um, we're going to go over today the uh, collections assessment grant, give you all some information so you understand the program and the application process. These are free half day site visits to either review your museum or archive collection uh, here in Connecticut. Um, applying is going to be really, really simple. Um, there is a link in the chat right now that will take you to the Conservation Connection website page for the Collections Assessment Grant. Um, you can look for it there. It's also listed under the grants on the Connecticut Humanities uh, website page. Um, guidelines are like usual. This is no different than any, any other Connecticut Humanities grant. We're going to be using their portal for applications. Um, big things to remember if you're going to apply to this grant project is that you have, we're giving priority to institutions that have budgets under $50,000. If you have a budget that is over $250,000, you're not eligible to apply. We're really trying to reach out to the small institutions um, and help them survey their collections and set priorities. Um, still have to be a 501c3 offer public programs and services. All the typical uh, requirements of Connecticut Humanities apply to this grant. Um, and as I was saying, this is for free half-day site visits. Um, there is no match, no in-kind that is going to be required. Just need to fill out a brief application that I'm going to go over with you by 11.59 p.m. on October 11th. And then we will be notifying everyone starting in November uh, about whether or not their application was successful. With projects having to be done in April of 2023, so this is a short, fast turnaround. Um, we will be assigning to you traveling curators, traveling archivists to come to your site to do these assessments. Because it's a half day, it's really hard to do everything. So you need to select which collection is the priority. Are you going to start with your museum collection? Or are you going to start with your archive so that we can match you up with the right person? Um, we also want you to kind of think about the size of your site. So many of you um, out there do have large campuses with multiple buildings, and we need you to think realistically. If you're a site with 10 buildings, it is not possible to survey 10 buildings in a half a day. So at that point, it would be, you know, need to focus on the tavern building, or you need to focus on another area. Um, if you wanted to focus on a type of collection, such as paintings, textiles, something of that nature, you know, all of any questions you have, anything that you think, I wonder if this would be funded, just email or call me so we can talk it out because I'd rather feel these questions and any concerns you have rather than have you walk away and think it may not uh, work for this project. As part of this, um, when you get your site visit, your traveling curator or traveling archivist is going to review your exhibition spaces, your storage spaces. They'll be reviewing policies and procedures. So if you don't have a collections management policy, you can pretty much guarantee that probably it's going to end up in your report. But that report that you're going to get is not a Bible. It's not a huge book. It's going to be a short report filled with observations and prioritized recommendations. Sometimes what we all really need is that outset 
outside uh, pair of eyes, come in, take a look and say, yeah, I see what you're talking about. I see your concerns. Here's where I would start first because, and that's what we're really hoping that these assessments are going to help everybody with is really seeing where they can start making changes, be able to articulate to funders, to their boards, why these areas are priorities. This is a report you should be able to use for fundraising purposes, to go to local organizations, to go to granting um, entities and say, we had X, Y, and Z person come in and recommend that we start working on this and this is what the scope of the project will be and we need funding to accomplish this. So this is all to help you do the best job you can possibly do at your site and, and um, provide that best standard of care that's within your wheelhouse um, to your collections. I'm gonna pause for a minute and I wanna turn things over to Scott um, before we go over the application to just kind of talk about whether or not if you've uh, used the CTH portal before or not, talk about the application process before we move on. Sure, thank you, Kathy. And this is uh, you know not the first time I know many of you have come to a info session to learn about grants, but I'm excited because this is the first time where it's not the, the Scott and Leanne show. This is really a partnership with uh, Conservation Connection and the Heritage Foundation and the work that Kathy Kragwell-Varda does. And we're just partnering with to support their grant line uh, in this initiative. Uh, it actually sprung out of uh, applications that some of you might have submitted from the Museum Makeover Program back many, many months ago when we realized there was definitely a need that we, we knew going in uh, to help organizations really get a hold of what their collections were and are. Um, and that's where this grant line came to, to be. So we're happy to be able to support it and to use our grant system to facilitate the applications, um, which means that you all don't need to learn another grant application system and create a new profile somewhere else. This will really uh, hopefully streamline things and make it easier for you all once you've uh, submitted grants to us. And I know many, many of you have, especially with the operating support grants that came out last year and are, and are open again right now, and I'll talk more about, um, it'll be an easy, easy uh, system for you to apply. Let me share my screen and show a couple of different things. To the right, please. I've lost where it's not showing me the show all windows. That'll do it. There's what I want to share. All right. Are we seeing the website now? Let's give a thumbs up. All right. So if you go to cthumanities.org, that is where our website is. That's where all information about grants lives. If you are to hover over and click on any of the grant lines that are on the right, you'll see the collections assessments are here, but it will quickly take you out of our system and take you to the Conservation Connection uh, website um, where there'll be more information about the grant, including uh, viewing our grant guidelines and the login to apply. If you have applied previously to Connecticut Humanities grants, you will have um, an account in our profile uh, in our in our uh, grants um, portal. Um, uh, when you click that button to log in, it will take you to a sign in screen that looks like this. If you remember your credentials, your email address is your login, and then change your password, and it'll take you to our to our dashboard at that point. If you don't remember that, you can say forgot your password, and immediately you can enter your email address, and it will send a link to that email to reset it so you can get back in. If that's not working, you don't know if you've got a um, a profile of your organization in the in, in the portal. Just email Leanne and I, and we can go in and we can check and see what's there and help you with any access points. Um, so, in many cases, access is going to be simple because you've been doing it for the operating support recently, and you can reset your password. But but don't get flummoxed. Just email Leanne and I when you've got a question, and we'll help you out. Um, when you have logged in and you are on your dashboard, it will look something like this. And I'm using Kathy Fields, who's our grants chair at the moment. You'll have three tabs along the top, the house, which is the home, which is the dashboard. And I log out, so I have to log back in. Hang on, I knew that was gonna happen. Log back in. This is not what it will look like. That's what it looks like for me. Uh, let me become Kathy Fields. It will look like this for you. 
you will have an applicant dashboard where any active requests you have open are. So if you had a CT Summer at the Museum grant, which some of you do, I know, or you had an operating support, which some of you do, I know, this is where that grant will live. If you go to the apply tab right next to it, that's where the existing grant lines that you could be applying for at this time are. The very first one is gonna be CT Cultural Fund Operating Support Grants. Uh, as many of you know, cause you were on the webinar with us uh, last week, that is open and live and able to accept applications now. It does not matter if you still have your grant from last year open, you can start that application today and submit it tomorrow if you're ready to do so. Any museum, historical society, historic site, cultural organization that applies will get at least $5,000. I know the vast majority of you on this call um, today got that funding, but I know a couple of you and I'm looking at the audience here did not. So we hope that you will apply. Uh, it is a guaranteed at least $5,000 award as long as you submit before 1159 p.m. on November 4th. But we're not here to talk about that today. So if you scroll down just below that, the next block is our collections assessment grants. Um, start an application by clicking the blue apply button. Do not click the preview. The preview will show you things, but you can't save anything. So always start an application with the blue apply button. And when you're here, you'll see the application, which I know Kathy is gonna take you through in a minute. So I'm not gonna steal her thunder, but my recommendation to you is as you work on this, it will auto save every five minutes or so. But if you're like me and you don't trust technology a lot and you wanna make sure you just entered this beautiful thing that you wrote off the top of your head that you had never put anywhere else, immediately after putting that beautiful thing that you've never put anywhere else, scroll down to the bottom and click save application. And therefore you'll make sure that if the power goes out or lightning strikes, you will not lose all of that wonderful prose that you just had. And you can save it as many times as you want. You can walk away and you can leave this and come back another day. Just know that if you start an application and you save it, you then want to go to your application dashboard to get at the saved application again. It will now become one of your active requests. And that's where you will find the started application and you would click edit to keep working on the application. If you click on the apply tab and you click apply, you will start a second copy of your application. So don't do that. Don't do double work. Know that once you save an application, it moves from apply to your dashboard where all the active things live. And I'm gonna stop sharing and stop talking there because that's really the nuts and bolts and Leanne and I can help with more of that. Um, but we just want to avoid frustration. So I know some of you are, are pros at this and, and it seems um, you know, a little bit repetitive, but um, for some people, knowing where your application lives after you start it is a huge uh, frustration saver. So we don't want anyone to be frustrated while working on these applications. All right, Kathy, I'm sending it back Wonderful. to you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Scott. I think that was really, really helpful for everybody, always knowing where to find your work once you've started it. I remember the first time I did that, did a CT humanities grant, I couldn't find it at all after I started it. All right, so let's look at the application. Okay, can everybody see that? Thumbs up, thumbs up, fabulous. Okay, so here we go, collections assessment grant. This is a very simple, short grant done so intentionally, um, is telling you to please go and make sure you re meet the requirements and review the guidelines ahead of time. Um, before applying, please, please, please email me um, at csl.conservationconnection at ct.gov to discuss your grant application. For grants that I do, such as Museum Makeover um, and other ones, the ones that Scott and Leanne supervise, your chance of having your grant approved increase if you talk it over with one of us ahead of time. So since I'm managing this grant program, please reach out to me, talk to me about the type of program uh, project you wanna do for co the collections assessment grant, and let's make sure that you have a strong application uh, from the get-go. I will be trying to, you can, if you submit it early, I will review your draft applications 
got to come in at least two weeks before the grant guidelines so I have enough time to review everything. But I'm happy to look that over and, and share any comments or feedback that I can to how you can improve your grant application. Now, as I mentioned before, we are giving priority to institutions with budgets under $50,000 a year. If your institution's annual expenses exceed $250,000, you are not eligible for this grant line. So just to make sure everybody knows while they're applying, you're gonna to have to answer that question so you don't get far along in the application um, before you find out you're not eligible. Um, again, we wanna make sure that your institution provides significant programs or services to the public on a regular basis, when are, that you are open, that you have special events and functions. So that's a, a common question that we use with Connecticut Humanity. And we also wanna know whether or not your institution owns its collection. Now, that might trip up a few of you. If it does, contact me. Um, basically what we want to make sure is that the people who are contacting us about the collections either own or have uh, responsibility for the collections. Um, Got to give this project a name so I can find you in the grant portal system. So we gave you a, a naming format. We're also looking to know a little bit more about who is responsible for your institution's collections. Now, some of you may have a paid full-time or part-time curator or archivist or librarian or someone else. Please just indicate whether they are paid or unpaid. Unpaid would mean a volunteer. We're just calling them unpaid in this way. Uh, other, just to kind of give you an example, if, for example, your uh, archives is kept in the local history room of your local library and the reference librarians are actually the ones who are responsible for overseeing and, and managing that collection, that might be something you would include there. We wanna know whether or not these collections are available to the public. Do you have them on exhibit? Are they available for research? I mentioned this early, but knowing how many buildings um, you have that whole collections or exhibits are gonna be really important and whether or not they're on the same site. You know, I know a few of you that I saw participating today may have a historic house museum, but you may also be re responsible for a one room schoolhouse that's located in town, but is on a different property. We, you know, this helps us as we're going through determine who would be the best match for your grant as a traveling curator or archivist and what's feasible in your project. Um, we also wanna have an idea of where your collections are stored and displayed. There's no problem with any of these. We know everybody uses attics and basements, every available closet, whether you have a designated storage room or any other room in your facility, or if you happen to use any offsite storage, just give us an idea of where things are located in your application. We also want to have an idea of how much of your collection is on display for the public. So this would be telling us how much of your collections are in exhibition, permanent or temporary, uh, versus what's in storage. A lot of places have a lot of their collection out. In some ways that makes it a little easier to do the collection assessment, but that doesn't, you know, we're here and the assessors will be going out to look wherever the collections are located. So. This just helps them gauge how their time is going to be spent on site. And then we want to have an idea of what the collection storage areas uh, uh, for your collections are like. And we have separate questions for both your museum and archive collections. So are you lucky that you have space to grow your collection where it's stored? Is it adequate? Is it full? Is it crowded? Again, you know, for example, if you say that it's their crowded spaces, well, we may have to ask you, um, where can we remove collections so we can really investigate and see what, what's in there if there's not a lot of space to move around. Um, we also want to know whether or not you have had an assessment of your museum or archive collection. And this could be that you had a CAP collection um, from AIC, Maybe you had an assessment of your archive from me and the Traveling Archivist program. Maybe you brought someone in through the Preservation Assessment Grant or IMLS. 
um, or just hired an outside consultant on your own. So just give us an idea of when that was. We're not specifically asking what it was, but was it within the last five years, more than five years ago, or only a portion of the collection was surveyed? And if you're not sure, that's okay too. Here, this next question, we really would like you to be able to articulate for us what is the significance of your institution's collections. And here we want you to kind of tell us how this ties to your institution, its mission, your community. What are your collection highlights? You know, what do you have that um, you're really proud that you think more people should know about and that you really want to make sure uh, is getting the attention it needs? Then we come down to the nitty gritty of what collections do you want to have assessed? Now, as I mentioned, so often, um, you know, we have this half day available to you. Doing both museum and archives can be a little challenging in such a limited amount of time, but you can either select your museum collection and you have some examples here, uh, furniture, glass, metal, textiles, clothing, decorative arts, paintings, Archives, those are all your paper base, photographs, ledgers, documents, manuscripts, scrapbooks. Um, you can pick one of those two to be assessed. And then we want you to tell us why you selected this collection. Does it, does it seem to have um, more present threats that you are concerned about? Does it have items that are more um, important to your mission? Um, Articulate for us why you selected this and why it needs to be assessed. And then what is your goal for this collection assessment? Are you looking to hopefully look and, and target what needs to have cons conservation? Are you looking for things that might be um, allocated or designed for future exhibitions? Um, do you need to reorganize the storage room, but you don't know how to go about it? Um, and need some help in understanding the priorities for storing and protecting and preserving these collections. And then from your perspective, what are the anticipated outcomes? What would a successful collections assessment mean to you? Does it mean better access? Does it mean better care and preservation? Does it mean having a better understanding of how to articulate the importance and relevance of this collection to funders um, members, the board, and the community at large. We then want you to kind of describe your institution, what type of institution you are, when year you were founded, what year you were incorporated. For some of you, that could be the same year. For others, it'll be different. Um, we would love you to include your institution's mission statement. This helps us really understand your collection and the mission that it's meant to carry out. Um, what is your budget? So we have a sense of that. You can see the choices there. See, it does not exceed $250,000. We also want to know what you are spending currently on collections care. Um, don't worry about COVID and, and changes. We just want to know, do you spend $100? Do you spend $1,000? What, what are you budgeting for collections care? Um, annually. And this past fiscal year is just fine. We don't need to go back. We want to know how frequently you're open. So we've given you a place to indicate that. You can also explain that if needed. We'd like to know how many paid um, full-time and part-time employees you have, as well as how many volunteers are currently helping you at your institution, and how many visitors you had last year. Um, as with all Connecticut Humanities grants, we need that uh, applicant information about who is the authorizing person, who's going to be your project director, um, who's the fiscal agent, who we're going to be handling the money. We would like you to attach, as usual, a current board list and a copy of your current year operating budget. And then, of course, you sign off on the application. So as you can see, a pretty short, really simple, this isn't really, there shouldn't be too much you have to look up here. I can understand looking at budget numbers, but you know, we're not asking how many items in the collection. Most of this, you should probably know your institution well enough to fill out. Um, so that's 
what we have for the application. As I said, the guidelines in the applications that Scott showed you are on the Conservation Connecticut website. You can just click on those links to find out. Um, you can email me for any questions you have, but right now is a good time to just open the floor if anybody has questions in the chat or um, want to just raise your hand and Amaris will probably find you better than I do. So I put a question in the chat, so I'm going to ask that in a second, but I wanted to say a couple of things here. So when it gets yes, to that please. part where um, the application was asking you how much money do you spend on collections care? don't go crazy you know look at look at your budget try to come up with the best estimate this does not mean you need to like add every receipt together and, and find all that stuff you know is it a hundred dollars is it a thousand dollars is it fifty dollars just give us your best estimate if your budget doesn't break it out in that way so we have a ballpark amount um if there were any parts of the application that you start going oh my god i don't know if i'm i'm eligible rather than just stopping the application there reach out to Kathy reach out to Leanne and I talk about it it's always better to have a conversation we actually got a question today um which ended up with a side side uh, discussion here um and, and our goal is to not find ways to to exclude but find ways to really serve the needs of all of the organizations here with, with the caveat as, as Kathy said we're really trying to find ways of having this support the smaller institutions in the state the all-volunteer institutions rather than just one more opportunity for some of the large well-staffed places that said i put a question here because i did see on the application um uh the sign up sheet for today of who's going to be here there were some university um and colleges that were here and wanted to know kathy your thoughts and if you are a sub entity of something and you have a budget that maybe is really small but you're part of like a large university um should you apply would you be eligible as that sub entity thing Yes, you're absolutely eligible. Thanks for raising that point, Scott. I really appreciate that. So we often know that um, universities, private schools, other schools may have really large overarching budgets, but what is your budget to manage a collection and exhibit gallery at any of these institutions? Um, yeah, you are certainly, don't say, oh my gosh, you know, I'm a sub entity of UConn, you know, I, we don't we don't fit the criteria. Well, what is the budget for your part of UConn? And that's just an example of um, just a big institution with some smaller museums under its umbrella. So absolutely. And that's a perfect time to kind of call and just run that past us. But yeah, if you're part of something large, but you have your own contained budget, you're absolutely eligible to apply. Great. Thanks, Scott and Kathy. Um, Claudette asks, what if you don't spend any money on collections care? That's fine. You are not, we, we will not be judging your application based on whether or not you spend money. We know for a lot of people, particularly in the last couple of years, keeping the doors open has been a big financial challenge. This is for our information, because if we can see that most of you maybe don't have money to spend on collections, well, that's something that Scott and Amaris and Leanne and, and I can all kind of talk about. What's, well, how do we help with that? You know, this grant came out of Museum Makeover because we identified a need. This grant could now identify a new need. So don't be afraid to write zero. You won't be, you won't be punished because of it, so. Okay, examples of, I see Catherine has put up, uh, what are some examples of costs that would be considered collections care? All right, so very simple. Have you bought acid-free boxes, shelving? Um, have you done any conservation work? Do you pay someone to, as a curator or an archivist? I think you absolutely can include that just so we understand um, the scope of it. But anything, you know, any supplies that you need for your collections? Databases. Mind, you mind, I'm sorry, what was that, Scott? Databases, past perfect. Yes. Uh, um, uh, Connecticut, Connecticut collections. collections. Did you buy a dehumidifier for the room because it needs it? Anything like that can be uh, put in. Um, Buying a laptop because you're using that for the collection solely and it's not, for other parts of the museum. Anything that is used for your collections, your archives, their care, their maintenance, their record keeping. 
And I just put up my phone number too. It's my cell phone because like so many people, I work primarily from home. So um, feel free to call or text at that number. Great, thanks, Kathy. That's very generous of you. Anybody um, just wanna raise your hand and ask a question live? I can't possibly have answered all of your questions. <laughs> I mean, that good on a Monday afternoon. I'm impressed with that. Wait, good. can you just give your contact information again, Kathy, please? Sure. It's in the chat, um, but you can reach me via email at C as in cat, S, well, no, C as in Connecticut, S as in state, L as in library. You think I would know to do that? Um, dot conservation connection, one word at ct.gov. Thank you. Sure. I should also say that this is a unique opportunity that has not been around before and that while Connecticut Humanities has had a grant line called capacity grants, which we still have, and that grant line can support a lot of different consultant led projects from strategic planning to doing audience assessments to doing things like this, doing a, a collections assessment. The nice thing about this is you are not competing with any of those other project types. You're not competing against the big organizations in the state that are coming in. It is a much streamlined application with much less details being asked from you. Uh, and we've got the ability to fund, I think it was 25 collections assessments now and another 25 assessments for a second offering of this in the future. Um, and you know, that's, that's a unique thing. Um, and, and, and hopefully that will make it really accessible to you all here. I know that there are a couple of questions in this application that are asking for things you um, need to provide in your operating support grants. The reason we're asking for those things a second time uh, is because we want to make sure that those responses are in this application for these reviewers and stealing questions that are going to get reviewed versus just a formula to give an award is a lot harder. So that's why we're asking for some of your staffing numbers again that we might have asked previously. Thank um, you, Scott. Great. Um, oh, I have a question. Sorry. If when is do you have any sense of when the second um, application will be like in a year from now or you have no idea? Um, yeah, the second year, I'm doing this off the top of my head, but I believe we'll be opening uh, July of next year, the second round okay. of the collection assessment grant. So I see there are a couple of questions before we get to them. I just kind of want to put one thing into context. So some of you may know about the uh, collections assessment program, CAP, that's run by the American Institute of Conservation, which is an excellent program. I've been an assessor for them since it started, and I'm not going to say what year. Um, CAP is a terrific program. The thing with CAP is that you're competing nationally to, for those funds. And there's a limited number of sites per year that get funding. Um, it's a long process. So people who apply this November will find out next winter. And then, you know, usually not before summer or fall of that year do the assessors go out. This is a lot faster. You know, we're able to send, you know, by Thanksgiving, you should be in touch with your assessor. You should get word on whether or not you've received funding. You guys should be then able to set up your site visit. And before everything opens for the next tourist season next summer, you'll have written recommendations on what you can be doing for your collections. And this information can be used in so many ways. When I do assessments, and I've been doing them for a really long time, it's not only what I see and what the collections look like, but how are they managed? And what is the knowledge base of the people and responsible for them? Or do I see things that are really terrific? I say, you know, you could do a fabulous exhibit with your quilts. Or, you know, this room is great, but if you did X, Y, or Z, you could really tell a great story and bring up more of your collections that are currently in storage. When we send assessors out, it's really to help you see the full picture and all the opportunities. Yes, there's gonna be things about rehousing something, improving storage somewhere else, maybe revamping your storage rooms or moving things around, using spaces that are more conducive to be storage versus exhibit or office spaces. 
that's all the kind of things that you can expect to have these conversations. And that's why we want to set you up ahead of time with these people uh, so that you can talk to these curators and archivists about your concerns and say, you know, I'm worried about this. I've noticed X, Y, or Z. I think there's mold in this room. I think I see moths in our textile closet. These are the kind of things you can raise and that they'll make sure to make a priority um, when they get out. Uh, were there other questions? Because the chat keeps getting longer on me and I keep- Yeah, no worries, Kathy. Um, so uh, Kathy had another question. Um, could we assess, can we request an assessment for more than one collection? More okay, than one type so, of collection. Right, so you can select museum or archive. Okay, so if you do your the museum collection, anything that falls under that umbrella term, furniture, decorative arts, textiles, paintings, things of that nature will be covered. If you do archives, it's all everything in your paper-based collections. Um, even if you have framed documents and photographs on the walls, those will all be taken into consideration. If your collection is extremely large or spread out in many, many buildings, then it's gonna be a little harder for you to select one or the other possibly, or to know how to kind of um, bring in, shrink that project a little bit so it's doable in half day, email or call me and let's talk out, um, you know, if you have the world's largest spinning wheel collection, well, let's talk about it and see if that's your priority. So. Leanne, was there something you wanted to? No, okay, got a, got a head shaking. But there, there was a question here from Allison about will this opportunity just be offered for two rounds or will it possibly become an ongoing grant opportunity? This is an excellent question. We can guarantee that there will be two rounds and we will fund 50 organizations over the course of those two rounds. Um, we can't guarantee beyond that. So if this is something that is of interest, I would highly encourage you all, if you don't come in the first round, to, to not miss the second round. Um, we are entering our next two-year biennial budget process here. As hopefully all of you know, we have an election this fall and in November, we'll be electing our new state legislature as well as the governor. This will lead to the next two years worth of Connecticut budget. While we're hopeful that increased funding will continue to come to Connecticut Humanities, which will allow us to do things like the CT Cultural Fund Operating Support Grants and things to support the organizations that get those grants, like this grant line. This grant line comes from the cultural funds as well and the support to all the organizations that we give grants to. Um, we won't know until um, the budget makes its way through and probably becomes law, ideally in May, but maybe not until June. Um, and that's when we'll really know what the funding is looking for the future. But I would say even if the extraordinary funding doesn't continue, and I have, I have high hopes that it will at some level, that it'll continue to allow for operating support and stuff like this, um, know that collections assessments would be able to continue as a grant option to Connecticut Humanities through our, our capacity grants, which are funded through a whole different pot of money. Um, but it's a different application. It's not as easy and you're gonna be competing against places doing strategic plans. So it's a, it's a long non-answer, but we're hopeful we're advocating on your behalf. This is why we're asking you guys to help us out with um, final report data and the surveys you've been doing with Susie Wilkening. And we're taking all of this and putting together our best advocacy ask on your behalf. And with Amherst and the Connecticut League and with Emily over the coming months, we're gonna let you know how you can help us out with this. We're gonna come up with an ask, a dollar amount. We're gonna ask you at that point to go to your um, legislators and tell them um, why they should continue to support this and how it helps you individually. And this is all things that will be coming from us and from Amherst and others over the coming months. Thanks, Scott. I mean, I think that the, the, the spirit is we would love to be able to continue this. The question is whether the funding will be there. Um, but, you know, I want to underscore what Scott said about the important role that all of you have to play in helping ensure that a higher level of funding continues um, for the sector, because you are the places where we can demonstrate the results of these funds at the community level. Um, so if you haven't already invited your legislators out to show them what, you know, what you're doing, um, you know, to show off the fact that your doors are still open because of operating support or 
you're doing a museum makeover project and here's the great stuff that you're going to be doing or summer at the museum was really wonderful and you know please come by and see what we've been doing um, this is the sort of work that can really help support people like scott and the folks at connecticut humanities um, you know developing that ask and then when we go back because of the thank you um, you know, people will be more inclined to say, yes, that was money well spent. I could see that happening in my community. So you're a really important piece of that. Advocacy grandstand over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Good job. Amy. Other questions about the grant line in particular. Um, it, Kathy, I did want to go back to you and make sure um, that you felt your question had been answered by Kathy, or were you trying to like, say like, can we request archives and museum at the same time? I don't know if you want to unmute yourself, Kathy, or if you're still here, Kathy Stebbins. No, you're good. All right, good. Excellent. Well, I'm sure more questions are going to happen as you start reading and considering, you know, how to pick one collection over the other. And we are here to help you talk out any of that uh, that you have. But like I said, it's a really straightforward application. I know there's going to be a lot of good ones, um, but we will have a terrific grant panel reviewing them and, and um, making the best selections and affording as many, you know, we have 25 for this year, as was said, 25 next year that we can fund, but you will also have terrific people to work with. And this is in addition to an operating support grant. One does not preclude the other. We would love it if you would uh, apply for and receive both. And Museum Makeover is yeah. coming up. The next round of Museum Makeover opens in November. So there's lots of applications you can fill out that do not cancel another one out. If you're not familiar with Museum Makeover, um, this is a program that Kathy also spearheads um, sort of in collabor collaboration with the League, but also with funds from Connecticut Humanities um, to make immediate improvements to the visitor experience at museums and historic sites around the state. Um, also operates on a sort of, we have a group of traveling curators who go out, you get several site visits from them. Um, as well as some funds to implement the project. Um, so you can learn more on the CLHO website at clho.org slash makeover. You're gonna be hearing a lot more from us about museum makeover and what year two is gonna look like, um, as well as have an opportunity to see some of the projects that were completed in year one um, once they're all finished in October. Um, so keep an eye out for more information about that, but this, that's another opportunity um, for you to make you know, really concrete improvements on a, on a short timeline. I think that's one of the things that this sort of um, shares in common with collections assessment um, grants is that it's really designed to give you a deliverable really fast. Absolutely, thank you, Amherst. Yeah. Well, we can end the recorded part of this if there are no more questions. Um, Kathy may be able to stick around for some, sure. you know, just take some direct questions from organizations as we were supposed to be here till two anyway. Um, but if there are no more, oh, let's see. Barbara asks, can you apply for this grant and museum makeover? Yes, yes. absolutely yes, you can. can. Well, if there are no more formal questions here, um, do any of our presenters have anything else they'd like to share? I think I'm good. Well, thank you again for being here. Um, we look forward to hearing from you again and seeing you at a future CLHO program. And um, I'm going to, I guess, close things out and um, we will see you again soon. Again, go to clho.org slash events for a list of all our upcoming programs, both um, virtual and in person. We hope to see you again very soon. And thanks for being here.